Okay, let's get into the Word. We're in a series entitled, So You Want to Be a Disciple. When Jesus spoke in Matthew 28, 19, we call it the Great Commission. He didn't say, go out there and make converts. He didn't say, get people to raise their hands and make a confession. What did he say? Make disciples. Disciple, what is that? That's someone who's sold out to Jesus. That's someone who's following Jesus with their whole heart. That's why we say our purpose statement at Horizon Community Church is to encourage people to follow Jesus with their whole heart. So this week, we're going, we're going over the seven uh, spirit-filled dimensions of a disciple, and this week, we're going to talk about worship. So if you want to be a disciple, you're going to worship God with your life. <clears throat> this is called a house of worship. I want to give you a, a little note about that. That's, you know, the church synonymous with house of worship. People use that term maybe more in yesteryear, but still today. But I want to tell you how to stay safe in the world. <clears throat> Number one, avoid riding in automobiles because they're responsible for 20% of all fatalities, okay? Number two, don't stay home because 17% of all accidents occur in the home. Number three, avoid walking on streets or sidewalks because 14% of all accidents occur to pedestrians. I didn't write that. I have a hard time believing that one. You might too. Number four, avoid traveling by air, rail, or water because 16% of all accidents involve these forms of transportation. Now there's 33% left. 30, 32% of all deaths out of that 33 occur in hospitals. So stay out of hospitals, okay? Okay. But I think you'll be pleased to learn today that only 0 .001, not 0 .1, 0 .001 percent of all deaths occur in a worship service in a church. So the safest place you can be is right here today. Let's give the Lord a hand for the house of worship, huh? So let's talk about worship. What, what, is, what is it about? First of all, you must know that we were all created to worship God. There's a term in the Bible, a mago day, and it means the image of God. And God created you. There's no, no one else that brought you into existence and being. You say, well, I was birthed out of my mother's womb. Yes, but God created that process. God created humankind. And so um, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Even in the, your mother's womb, the Bible says, God is doing his work in there, Okay. You have a unique personality. You have a unique look, a unique uh, structure of makeup for your whole being. There's no one else in the world like you. You're unique. And God says you're wonderful. Some of you don't feel that way about yourselves, but he's given you good gifts. And as you find your way to him, you'll find out how to put everything in play where fulfillment comes to you. And that's what we're talking about today with worship. You were created to worship. He created you. And now you have a void in your heart, and until you turn to your creator, which is salvation, but you can be a Christian and not really have your heart on Jesus, right? You can have made the confession, but not be living it out with your life. But this you must know, you're hardwired, your creator hardwired you in the very fabric of your heart to worship him. And you're created with that capacity to worship God. It's natural in you. And everybody will naturally worship God. Uh, they'll have this heart to worship something. And if they don't worship God, then they'll worship someone else. Maybe something else, but usually someone else. We're created with that as our natural order. And everybody has that in them. And the void will be filled when we say, yes, Lord, I'm going to turn my heart to you. So if you don't worship him, you'll worship someone else. Let's talk about Taylor Swift for just a moment, okay? <clears throat> I'm not saying she's the devil. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm thinking people are really close to worshiping her these days, right? She's done some remarkable things. Uh, I mean, the Beatles, Elvis Presley, Elton John, all of them combined have never done what Taylor Swift has just done in, in our society. Uh, she's not only going into cities and filling stadiums. I'm not talking about... Um, I'm not talking about arenas like basketball. I'm talking like football stadiums. And by the way, Taylor, could you just leave us football at least? Like, don't get involved in football. Just stay in music, would you? But 
But she's not only filling those stadiums once, she's filling them two or three times in these cities at 60 to 80,000 people. That's unbelievable. She will gross a billion dollars this year uh, because of those concerts. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, she grossed a billion last year. She'll gross another billion this year. And no one's ever gone over a billion before in sales at a concert. That's not to mention the two or $300 million in merchandise. Now, she's gifted, right? But where'd she get her gifts, right? God gave her all that ability to write and break up with boyfriends and all that. That was her story, you know? <laughs> and and uh, um, if it wasn't for those boyfriends, she'd be nothing. I'm just saying, all right? <laughs> but, but, I mean, people just go crazy over Taylor Swift and... They cry, you know, just like they did with the Beatles. Let me tell you why that is. Because they're, they're created to worship someone. And they're, they, they, so if they don't worship God, they'll go somewhere else. That someone else is great. But now, Taylor has a good reputation for being good to her fans. But she doesn't know any of you. And she never will. As a matter of fact, she pays security so you don't get close to her, right? She can't know you intimately. Probably it's impossible, but she may not even, she just can't know everyone, but God knows every one of you, and God created you. He knows every hair that's on your head. He knows what you're going through that's hard or good or bad, and he cares about you so much, and he gives you a special invitation to come in close. You say, well, does he demand that we worship him? <clears throat> he doesn't demand anything. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. You can do whatever you want to do, but when you realize how great he is and how good he is, and how wonderful he is, and what he's done for you, because you, you're thinking, where are you, God? Well, every good and perfect gift com, comes from the Father, and everything good in you, he placed it there. When you realize it, you'll naturally turn and start to worship him, and then that fulfillment will come to your heart. God is good, and he cares incredibly. The word worship is a modern form of the old English Word, worth-ship, meaning worthiness. So what's God worth to you? That's what our worth is. That's what we mean when we say worship. What is he worth to you? And then you express it to him. If he's not worth much, maybe you don't want to, to you, maybe you don't want to express that. But he's the giver of all good gifts. As a matter of fact, everything that the doctors know that is good, I'm not against doctors, but every good and perfect gift comes from a doctor. So every, everything they know came from him. He's the one who allowed that to come in being. Wealth. People say, man, you know, that guy's gifted to wake wealth. Wealth. Did you know that the Bible says that God gives the ability to make wealth, to bring wealth? That even he gave that ability to that woman or that man to bring that money forward in good business dealings. And every wonderful gift you have has come from him. And when you return it back to him, when you ascribe to him his worthiness, his goodness, your heart gets filled up. So worship is ascribing to God his worthiness, worthship from that word, his reputation to you. His, it's giving him respect. It's giving him the reverence he's due as creator. And here's what it says in Psalm 96, 8. It says, give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. Worship. Did you know that worship of anything else is misappropriation of creation? You've heard of misappropriation of funds. You're, you're, you're taking something that's not yours and giving it to someone else. Misappropriation. Like, if there's anybody under 10 now, you might want to take them out, Mom in this room, because I want to talk about Santa for just a second, okay? Santa's not real. Now, that whole Santa thing comes from a real story. Like, like there was St. Nicholas way back there. You, you, you know, at one time, there was only the Catholic Church. Did you know that? So you, you all come from the Catholic Church in our, in our heritage at some level. But Catholic means the one church in the world. That's what it means. And then there became de denominations. And I'm not saying the Catholics are right and everything. I don't think they, they necessarily are. But they say that 10% of them are born again. And that would still be the largest denomination of true believers in America at 10%. So <clears throat> there's a lot of, Jesus must like them. He made a lot of them. 
and and so so but but let's get back to Santa. I have no idea where he's going with Catholic. Let me get out of this. Uh, <clears throat> but but so so I never told my kids. Yeah, I was. I know what I was saying. That that Saint Nicholas was a Catholic priest, and he did give gifts two children, and he was a great man, and that's where that evolved into the Santa we have today, who comes down the chimney, and all that. But I, I told my kids right from the start that Santa's not really real. It's just fun. That's what I told them. It's just fun because he was a, a godly guy who gave gifts to the poor and to children, and so that's a celebration that we use, and some people like to tell their kids it's real, but it's not. So I told them there's no Santa, but there is a Stanta. Like, my name's Stan, and I told him, Stanta is the one who buys your presents. He works hard, and he goes to the store, and he finds out what you like, and then he gets it for you because he thinks you're special. Mom and dad do that. Now, really, who's the giver of all good gifts? It's God, so you could say that he's the one who does that. But my point is, this, this round, jolly guy who doesn't even exist is taking all, all the love that I could get from these kids because I'm the one who's doing that. And that's that's... And, he, you know, he doesn't even exist. And that's how it is with God. We're giving it everywhere else, but to the, the one who really, truly deserves that love and that worship because he's the one who, who brings all the good things into our lives. We were created to worship him. And until we do, we will not fill that void in our lives. Secondly, the act of worship is an all-encompassing lifestyle. We think of it when we say worship as Hillsong or Bethel, these people who put together awesome, awesome worship uh, albums. We think of it as we're a worship service. We come in and we sing to God. And it's not wrong. That is worship, but it's only one aspect of worship. Worship is really your whole life in service to God. You're worshiping the Lord with your life. What God has made you is his gift to you. What you return to him is your gift to God. It's your worship to him. And if you take all the credit for it, or you put it in places where it's not used for him at all, you're not returning it to him. Like, 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 like Taylor, it would be awesome if she returned it to him, right? What could happen if she returned her heart to be fully his? So your giftings, but not only your giftings, your faithfulness to God, your time, talent, and treasure... That's all worship to God. Are we worshiping him with our lives? Look here at Romans 12.1. I know I quote this scripture a lot, but I, I really like it. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's a lot. A living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper what? Worship. Wow, our lives. I told someone this morning before I started to preach, this is it's a hard one to hear because America's not, not there anymore. Now, I know there's, there's hundreds of thousands and millions who haven't bowed their knee and f who follow faithful, faithfully, but in general, we, we, don't, we don't think of this. We don't think of what we can do for God with our lives as worship. We think of the American church, what God can do for us. Well, he's already done it. And he'll continue to do good things for us. But our lives, it's not, it, this worship is not about what you, you can do for me. It's what you've done for me and what I can do for you. Lord, use my life. One huge, huge part of worship is being faithful and obedient with your lives. Now, I'm, I'm all for grace. Where would I be? Where would you be without grace? But again, the American church, man, we're losing it. We're losing the, the balance between grace and truth that's in the Bible. We're going only to grace, and truth doesn't matter as much anymore. God, forgive me. I'm out, and I'm drunk again, and I slept with another, not me. I'm just making this up. I slept with another woman, and, you know, all this stuff, God, forgive me, over and over and over every weekend? Come on, man. I like what Winston Churchill said when, <clears throat> when a, a waiter spilled uh, a drink on him twice. Like he did it once and then later he did it again. The guy said, oh, I'm so sorry. And Churchill said, don't be sorry, be different. Like there's a, there's a, there's a lot of people who don't even serve God that can do the right things. 
how much more should the people of God be able to follow the truth of God with the grace that the Holy Spirit gives and enables? The grace of God that not only forgives, and we need it, don't get me wrong. I'll preach on that someday big. You can't get saved without the grace of God. But the truth of God, the truth is that we can live faithful and obedient lives. I didn't say perfect, but God's asked us to be faithful. And when we're faithful and obedient, our lives are worshiped to him where good things happen all around us. Where, where families grow up strong because mom and dad were faithful to God, faithful to them faithful to the, to the job, the circle they run in, and that just builds healthy people everywhere that can trust. A lot of people don't trust in this world because they had people all around them that weren't trustworthy. But God's completely trustworthy, and he says, I would like my kids to look like me. And if you look like me, more people will turn their hearts toward me. And Paul likened his life and worship to God as this. It's an interesting concept. I love this. As a drink offering. What's that mean? Let's read it in Philippians 2. But I will rejoice, Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I will rejoice even if I lose my life. Pouring it out like a liquid offering or another version of that same uh, translation or that same passage is, is a drink offering, a liquid offering, a drink offering. Just like your faithful service. You see, his drink offering is faithful service. Is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. So let's talk about a drink offering for a moment. It refers to an Old Testament practice of a priest pouring the wine out uh, after the sacrifice of a lamb or a ram. Now, now we don't do this anymore because the Old Testament, um, the, 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 the covenant was fulfilled, and now we have Jesus who was the sacrifice once for all, the only way to come to God, the only one who died for our sins, the place where grace is offered, no matter what we've done wrong or where we've been, it's through Jesus Christ. So we don't need the lamb anymore. But in those days, this is what Paul was talking about in the New Testament, that priest would pour the wine around the altar, and here's what it meant. It symbolized the, the dedication of that person in worship to God. So when Paul says, a drink offering, I want to be a drink offering, he's saying, I want to worship God with my life. And he, he felt that his life was being poured out as an act of worship. So think of this. Paul goes to prison. Like a lot of us would say, God, where are you? I, I don't deserve to be here. Paul didn't deserve it. He's just sharing the gospel and people are mad at him. But what, you know what he did? He just said, um, Lord, my life's a drink offering. Here I am. What do you want to do with my life? While he was in jail, he said that. And God said, why don't you sit down? Because I'm going to write through you. And there he is in jail, and instead of complaining, what happens is life is a drink offering. God just starts to pour into him because he's going to pour out to us. Two-thirds of the New Testament were written by this guy, and most of it when he was in prison or captivity. Amazing. Amazing. His life, regardless of where he was, regardless of the hardship of being shipwrecked uh, many times, of being stoned, and I'm not talking medicinal marijuana, I'm talking actual rocks hitting his head, you know, that sort of thing. They thought he was dead. This guy went through a lot, but he just considered it his life an offering unto God. Wow. It's a hard thing to say, and I, I'm not, I hope I can live up to it, but I want my life to be a drink offering to God. I'd like to live my life for him in such a way that it made a difference for others and, and that all the glory went to him. Now, I'm not getting that 100% right, but I'm, I'm after it. I'm after it. I, 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 I want to be a drink offering unto the Lord. 2 Timothy 4, 6, we see at the end of his life, Paul would say it again. This is another passage. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. So he's coming to the end of his life and he's saying, I'm still there, Lord. I, st I still want to give everything, everything to you. And you know, you feel like, especially if you're a young person, oh man, if I, if I serve God, I won't have fun. It's just a lie from the enemy. Christians, followers of Jesus have more fun than anyone if they're doing it right. I know, there, I know, there's, uh, I, I know there's, there's families and people that are believers in Christ that that aren't living it, or perhaps they're in a trial in their life, and it may not be so. But overall, when you look at life, I believe believers in Christ have more fun than anybody. You know why? 
because you're not bowing to the porcelain God on Saturday morning and just puking your guts out. You're not having to leave your, your spouse uh, because of your behavior and you're trusting God and you're following God and ultimately you, 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 you have short-term discipline. That's true because you trust God and his word, but you have long-term pleasure, long-term safety, long-term wholeness. And, and, and so when you pour your life out, you're not giving up something, you're gaining something. When you live for him, the greatest joy of all comes to your life uh, and there's fulfillment and, and, and relationships, but there's fruit. You know, I'll tell you, it's fun, bearing fruit. And that's what he said. If, if we're not bearing fruit, the Bible says that he cuts us off as a branch, you know, throw us into the fire. Now, I don't know exact, I don't, that, that could mean hell, but I think it means more than hell. I think it means that there could be other problems that, that arise in life because we're, we're, we're too busy doing other things and not busy about his work. And so our works are burned up. But he said, I am pouring my life out as a drink offering. We're to worship God and serve God with a heart of obedience and gratefulness, with a heart to be faithful in every aspect of our lives. Colossians 3.17, think about your work. Sometimes you want to complain about your work. I've wanted to complain about my work before. I, I had some jobs that were tough ones. I remember I used to work at a, at a mattress factory when I was a teenager, and you know those, those borders that they have around the springs, those, those rims? I had to take that little circle thing and sew those springs with the border and put them together, and here's what kept happening. Those things would go into my hand, man, and just kind of dig in, and, and I'm getting three bucks an hour to get my hands all torn up, you know? And, and I didn't feel like worshiping God when I went there because uh, I didn't like that job. And if we're not careful, we, we can not only not be grateful that we have some income coming in, but did you know that things change when you, when you start to focus the way God tells you to? Look at Colossians 3.17, and whoever, I'm sorry, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, to include work, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Like one of the things I'd say to spouses, husbands, and wives is, don't, don't say the negative things to one another all the time. Don't tell him what he isn't all the time, your husband. I, and husbands, I mean, I want to help you. Don't, don't talk about your wife's appearance in a negative way, ever, ever, ever. All that's going to do is make her not want to present herself to you in any way because she's not feeling good about you. And I'm not talking about manipulation, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I really think this about Karen Russell, and I'm sorry. She can't be perfect. So all you other women, she's not perfect, all right? Just tell your, tell your husbands when you drive home. She's not perfect, okay? <clears throat> but man, I, I think she's awesome. I can't believe that I get to live with her and go places with her. And she makes me happy, and I tell her on a regular basis. And you know what? She tells me nice things, too. And you know what that results in? We really like to be with one another. But if you're saying, well, you don't do this and you don't do that and you didn't do this for the kids and you didn't do that, how, how about if we go another way and start to speak thankfulness? Now, I'm talking about praise to God because you may think, well, you know, he hasn't done so much for me. Well, let me speak to that for a moment. He's done everything for you. You just don't realize it yet. And he's got everything planned beautifully for you if you just take his hand. He's got a plan for your life. Now, if you don't want to, you don't have to. He won't make you. But if you do, you'll find out what many of us have found out. It's not a life of perfection. It's not a life where everything goes easy all the time. As a matter of fact, you see, if you really live it for God, you might be persecuted as Paul was. But it is a life that is fulfilled and it's the best life to live on this earth. And the place where there be no more pain or sorrow, that has to do with Jesus too. That's called heaven. The only way to get there is to bow your heart to him and say, I will follow you with my life, to give your heart to him, and then you get heaven as your home. And guess what? No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears there. The old order's passed away. Here we get help through trouble. We don't cause as much trouble as many people have because we trust him and try to follow his word, but we're still going to have trouble that we didn't cause. Sometimes we'll cause our own, even as, as we try not to. But he loves us, he'll forgive us, he's full of grace, he'll enable us, he'll help us to go forward, and we can grow in him. And here's what he says, I'd like for you to recognize that I've done a lot of good for you. 
I'd like for you to recognize and be thankful in all things because when you turn your heart towards me, my heart turns towards you. A faithful, obedient life says to Christ, you've given your all to me, I want to give my all to you. It says, you are worthy of my obedience. It says, I want to be a faithful follower of you, Jesus, because you have been so faithful to me in every way. I choose to love you, Jesus, with my whole life because you first loved me and gave me your whole life. You've given me everything. So I return my life to you. Now, faithfulness and obedience to God isn't just what we do. It's what we don't do sometimes. And we don't do things um, beyond the word of God. Now, I, I know we, we stumble, we fall, but I'm talking about a faithful, obedient life. It's possible to live one. Not in perfection, but moving and growing and becoming more like Christ all the time. It's called sanctification. We can do it. He helps us. We can become more and more like him all the time. But I think of Joseph. And, you know, he's, he's blessed not only for what he does, but for what he didn't do. In Genesis 39, we see that Potiphar's wife, Joseph's been completely faithful in the house of his boss, Potiphar, his boss put him over everything, all the servants, the whole household, all the business. And the wife of Potiphar sends everybody out of the house and she tries to sleep with this young man, Joseph, who's a handsome young man. And he says, hey, my boss has been good to me, but that wasn't really his core motivation. He, didn't, he wasn't going to sleep with her. And look what it says in Genesis 39. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. His his. Key thought, the motivation of his heart was, I don't want to sin against God. He's been so good to me. And he was worshiping God by being faithful and obedient. And even though he was thrown into prison, think of that. The guy accused of rape and thrown into prison, and he rises to second in the kingdom ultimately. I would say pretty much you're politically dead if that happens, right? If you've been accused of that. But in the Bible, it was shown that this was false, and eventually... He rises to be second in command in the greatest nation in the world. And really, that king said to Joseph, you take it. Whoever your God is seems to be blessing everything you do. You take it. So honoring God is not really losing anything. It might be temporarily suffering. It might be going through some things like Jesus did so that we might be blessed as he got up on that cross, shed his blood, died for our sins. By the way, they didn't take his life. He gave it. I don't like it when a preacher says spilled his blood because spilling is an accident. This was willfully shed that we might be forgiven of our sins. The wrath of God fell on him so it wouldn't fall on us for our sin. And we are forgiven and loved and taken in by grace. So Joseph honored God with his life and he was worshiping him. Now let's, let's turn now to worshiping with music and song because that's what most people think about worship. And it's not a bad thought. It's still true. It's just a portion of worship. Our whole life is worship, right? But let's talk about music for a minute. Worshiping with music and song invites God's presence. Here it is in the Bible. Worship enables us to experience God. Look at Psalm 22, 3. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Another version, another translation of that original text says, you inhabit the praises of your people. And what that means is when his people come together and corporately start to play these songs and sing this music and start to extol his qualities and say how great he is and to bless his name, that he comes in in a special way. He inhabits the praises. Now, <clears throat> he's in the heart of every believer. That's true. The Holy Spirit, God, is in the heart of every believer. He's omnipresent, which means he's already everywhere. And yet, he said, come close to me and I'll come close to you. What's that about? I mean, it's the Bible. It means that we can feel his tangible presence in a greater way when the Holy Spirit shows up and the Holy Spirit starts doing his work. And remember, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three in one, the Trinity. 
And when we start to praise God, Jesus said, uh, I've done great things, but you're going to do even greater. I leave you the Holy Spirit. And he said that we, did, we could do miracles. That's not us, but it's God doing miracles through us. It's, 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 not, um, it's not that we should be praised, but he, he says, I'm going to use your life. I'm going to flow through you so people will turn their hearts to me. Those gifts of the Spirit, we're not the gift. It's the gift flowing through us when it happens, right? But his presence comes in. Have you, have you ever felt that? Where you begin to worship and you, and you just sense that the whole, the whole atmosphere is changing in the room. Sometimes it changes just for you as the Holy Spirit starts to speak. Psalm 100 shows us again. Shout out praises to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with joy. Enter his presence, his presence with joyful singing. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we belong to him. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Here it is, church, the place of worship now. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give him thanks. Praise his name. So this isn't just something we decided like, hey, we like music and we, we think that's cool, so we're going to do it. Nope, this is something that's in the Bible that was practiced and God says, I show up when you do this. And he even gave us direction to do it. At the center of worship is corporate worship where we all come together. Now, if you're watching at home, I just want to say, I'm glad you're watching. That's awesome. Some of you can't at attend because of, of uh, sickness that you may have or a disability. And we love you very much. But we'd like you to show up here too. And I'll tell you why. There's a dynamic that happens in this room that, that, that can't be uh, transferred to online. There's something about the presence of the Lord when he seats himself among us when we start to praise. And I would say some services a little and some services a lot, you feel it. I don't know the dynamic of that, but I'll tell you what's attached to the moving of the Holy Spirit. It's not just, it's not just the singing and the worship and the extolling God, but it's hearts that really love him and turn to him. And, and there's a lot of prayer that goes on. When there's prayer that's gone on before, it all intensifies when we come together. And so, so we start to pray. And that phrase, again, uh, place of worship is, is synonymous with his, his church. So praise leads us into the presence of God. Now, I want to talk about some Hebrew words first here that, that are words that explain these things that we do for praise. Uh, let me tell you that when Jesus walked this earth, they were still in the old covenant. He's bringing, he's fulfilling the old covenant and the New Testament had not been written until he died. That New Testament, those books were written by the eyewitness apostles. Even Paul was an eye, eyewitness, right? So they saw him, they walked with him, they saw the miracles, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this was written, and we talked about the Word of God and, and how it's an amazing book just last week. If you didn't hear that, check it out. I think it'll, it'll bless you. But, but, but now... We, we have these Old Testament words. And what I want you to know is that Jesus worshiped this way. So Jesus was in, coming out of the Old Covenant, walking in that time. So these things that they, the ways that they praised in Hebrew was the way that Jesus praised when he walked this earth. So the Old Testament praise stuff doesn't necessarily disappear. The, the covenant is fulfilled in Christ, but worship to God is still in place. So with that in mind, I, there's, there's a number of words that would help us understand worship. But I want to show you what we're doing corporately and publicly, how it's in the Bible. So let's look at eight of them. Halal. Halal is the word in, in Hebrew, hallelujah. And hallelujah means um, praise, that's hala, and, and yah is God. And it's to celebrate extravagantly, hallelujah. So we say, so you hear all these people say, hallelujah, you know, and you think, what's the big deal? Well, God, God likes those hallelujahs. I'm just going to experiment here a little bit. I'm going to show you how it works. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! We'll talk about shouting, too. That's coming up here. All right? And then second, taqwa. And that means to applaud. And I'm making a new rule starting today. I'm tired of a smattering of applause. If one of us claps, you don't have to, but I'm just going to say. If one of us claps, all of us clap, okay? So how about this? Let's just clap and thank the Lord for his goodness. <laughs> Hallelujah! Doesn't that feel better? Yeah. And, and that expresses joy and victory. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, 
when they would go out to battle and they'd win, they'd come in and the people would clap and the clapping was a sign of God has given us victory. So when we clap, even that, you, you think that's just something that naturally happened. It's something that God asked for in the word. And these passages I'm listing as we go here that you can look up. And then yada, that's the extended hand, but not up, it's out. Yada expresses gratitude and thankfulness and it's, it's surrender. And, and it's a humble gesture towards the Lord. Toda, that is to raise or lift your hands and express adoration. It says in the New Testament, God says, I want all people everywhere to lift up holy hands to the Lord. That comes from the Old Testament teaching of Tauda, which is expressing adoration and thanksgiving. And so, now you don't have to lift your hands and you don't have to do this. And in a way, you know, if you can fake it, it wouldn't be worth anything, right? So I can't really tell who's most spiritual because I can't discern all the time. But I know this, that these are things out of the Bible. And if we, were to, if we express with a sincere heart, and, and some of you dudes, man, you go, like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a little too cool for that. I just, and then you, you know, Brock Purdy and the Niners, you act like an idiot, you know, and you throw your popcorn and, you, you know, you're just so excited about the Niners. Okay, okay. Well, how about if we got excited about the one thing that really counted? And I'm not against the Niners. Well, I actually am against the Niners. <laughs> But, but I'm not against you being for the Niners. How about that, okay? And, and, um, but, but he's worthy. I mean, I mean, Brock Purdy's a good guy. I love that he stands for Jesus. But, man, he hasn't done for us what Jesus has done. He didn't die for us. He didn't give us everything. He didn't, make, he didn't pave the way to heaven so we can lift our hands. And then Shabbat, that, there it is, to shout praise. To sh so even these radicals, you know, yeah, this is a lot, but... There's a lot of shouting that goes on for sports and concerts, right? It's just, it's, it's not that it's bad. It's just that this is best. Shouting praise to the Lord. What's that look like? I'm going to do it sincerely, but I'm going to do it loud. You're awesome, God. I love you. You've been so good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to me. You know what that does? On days I don't feel it, it makes my heart come around. And when he's... When he sees me in a trial doing that, you know what he does? He just comes to me strong. He says, I'm with you, son. Because I'm, 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 I'm not thinking of the things that would weigh me down. I'm thinking of the one thing that would lift me up. And it's him. And then Zamar. It's to worship the Lord while playing an instrument. That's right. I mean, as a matter of fact, that's probably where all the music came from in this world. Only it turned away from the Lord into other things. And again, I'm not, I'm not against it. Some of it's against God, but most of it's just music, you know. But in its best form, man, to me, it, it turns to God. And, and then something happens, you know, they, 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 they talk about jazz and the, and, and the spirit of it. You know, I'll tell you about a spirit, a Holy Spirit that comes when you start to, to worship God. And the beauty of that to worship him while playing the instrument and singing songs. This is all from the scriptures. These, these are principled forms of worship from God's word. And then Kara is to dance before the Lord. David danced before the Lord. His, his wife made fun of him, and uh, she got in trouble with God on that one. But he, now, now, you know, there's a unique and there's a normative in the Bible. So the normative is we can, we can praise the Lord even with dance. But the unique is David danced in his underwear. So we're not going to do that, okay? Like that was just once and it's not a principle. But really he stripped down to what was a linen cloth that, that we call, I'm calling it underwear, but it was undergarment. And he was just saying, I'm willing to just humble myself in such a way I don't care what other people think. That was, that was what he was doing. So he danced before the Lord. Now I got a word for you. You know, I was raised where dancing was bad, you know. As a matter of fact, um, um, we, they didn't believe in premarital sex because it could lead to dancing. That's how bad it was in those days. Uh, uh, but Jesus probably danced. Like, like they, had, they had the, um, you know, the wedding at Cana. I'll tell you some unique things that, that, that kind of balances it out is, is the Hebrews never danced with the opposite sex. 
they, the men would dance with the men and do their things in a circle and choreographed, and then the women would dance at the wedding. And, and, and um, so, 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 but dancing before, before the Lord, whether choreographed or for the Lord, I mean, you know, the individual here, he's so blessed that God gave victory. And I've seen people get healed in a moment and just take off dancing. And you know what I say? You dance, brother, because the Lord is good. Look what, look what the Lord has done. All right? And then Barak, the last one, to kneel in reverence and humility to bless the Lord. And you, you know, I like to do this most when I'm alone, to kneel. And here's what I'm thinking when I, when I kneel. I'm just recognizing how great he is and how great I'm not. <laughs> I'm just recognizing that anything good that's ever happened out of my life happened because of him. Even before I was saved, all the good things that happened, happened because of his goodness. And I'm recognizing that he even loves me so much, he'll tell me how stupid I'm being sometimes with my interaction with my loved ones. And nobody's ever loved me more than him enough to help me to change so that my family could be better. Look at that. But he's done that for me. He's helped me be self-aware so I could love my family better. And I'm still growing. I'm still becoming. Sometimes when I kneel, it's Father, forgive me because we, we need that ongoing grace, don't we? But he's worthy of all these expressions. All of them bring the beauty of his presence. I mean, you can kneel alone in your living room and the God of heaven comes to meet you. He comes to meet you. As a matter of fact, I think that's where you might be able to test it most and find it true. Is alone in that prayer closet. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our response time today, we're going to just praise the Lord. We're going to spend some time worshiping God. We, we did a little up front. We're doing a shorter sermon, and now we're just going to take several minutes here and just start to worship him. And at some point, Pastor Mike is going to just call us forward. And if you're comfortable with that, come forward. And we're just going to lift him up and we're going to see, we're just going to humble ourselves and see if the beauty of his presence won't show up wonderfully. It's going to show up for some of us. I know that's true. Stand to your feet, would you? Pastor Mike will lead us in worship. of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you come on we sing Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. none besides you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me come on church sing worthy Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Come on, we sing Jesus. 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy, holy. There is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Church, I'd love to just invite you down forward to this altar. So if you would come and draw close to God, the Bible says that if we draw close, he will draw close to us. So come on, it's open down here. Come fill this altar. God, you are so worthy of all of our praise. Thank you, Jesus. We give it to you now. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord, worthy of our praise. Come on, would you sing, I will build. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I shaking, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our worship, God. In your moment, there is rest. You know, God cares about you so much. I want you to extend your hands in that form of worship, just humility. Expressing your need before God. Now, I want you to think of the one thing that you need from the Lord right now. With all sincerity and authenticity, I want you to offer that up to God. Say, God, I need your help. Whether it's a broken relationship or finances or some difficulty that you're having that you can't resolve at work. God cares about you so much. Whether it's disease or physical affliction that is on your body. I want you to just offer it unto the Lord. And here's what I want you to pray with me. We're going to pray, come Holy Spirit. Would you just say that to the Lord around your knee? Come Holy Spirit. Just say it. Come Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, touch our hearts and lives. Lord, let your miracles flow. Let the one who's been for... I just feel like the Lord would, would say that there's a woman who's been forsaken by men over and over and over again. And you're just, you're just thinking, well, love will never come my way. And God says, start with me. You can trust me, and I'll lead you to a trustworthy man. I just believe the Lord would say that to someone today because he cares about you. He's not against you. He's for you. There are many, many men in this world that have failed God and failed others, but God will never, ever fail you. Jesus 
will never ever fail you. So Lord, we're thankful that you're so good, that you're so loving, that you're here for us, that you would speak to even the specifics in our hearts and lives. We praise you for that. Let's worship him around that need we have right now. Let's just put it before him. Come Holy Spirit and worship one more time before we go. Sing unto the Lord. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe. Come on. I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Fail, oh, you never fail. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Come on, church, would you just lift this up one more time? Sing your promise. Your promise still stands. Great is your faith. Come on, every voice we declare your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. Oh, you never fail me. Yet. So thank you, Lord, for meeting us here today. Holy Spirit, thank you for touching our hearts and lives in a real and tangible way. As we go from this place, Father God, help us to remember that worshiping you with our lives is what you really want. And it leads to intensified worship corporately, God. That's beautiful. And help us to be people who live lives of love, live lives of grace, and live lives of truth and even righteousness, God. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you and return our lives to you because you've given us so much. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen.